Chapter Eight of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. Chapter Eight. Harry Collins, twenty twenty nine. The guards at Stark Falls were under strict orders not to talk. Each prisoner here was exercised alone in a courtyard runway, and meals were served in the cells. The cells were comfortable enough, and while there were no telescreens, books were available. Genuine old-style books, which must have been preserved from libraries dismantled fifty years ago or more. Harry Collins found no titles dated later than 1975. Every day or so an attendant wheeled around a cart piled high with the dusty volumes. Harry read to pass the time. At first he kept anticipating his trial, but after a while he almost forgot about that possibility, and it was well over a year before he got a chance to tell his story to anyone. When his opportunity came, his audience did not consist of judge or jury, doctor, lawyer, or penologist. He spoke only to Richard Wade, a fellow prisoner, who had been thrust into the adjoining cell on the evening of October eleventh, two 2013. Harry spoke haltingly at first, but as he progressed the words came more easily, and emotion lent its own eloquence. His unseen auditor on the other side of the wall did not interrupt or question him. It was enough for Harry that there was someone to listen at last. So it wasn't a bit like I expected, he concluded. No trial, no publicity. I've never seen Leffingwell again, nor Manshoff. Nobody questioned me. By the time I recovered consciousness I was here in prison, buried alive. Richard Wade spoke slowly for the first time. You're lucky. They might have shot you down on the spot. That's just what bothers me, Harry told him. Why didn't they kill me? Why lock me up, incommunicado this way? There aren't many prisons left these days, with food and space at such a premium. There are no prisons left at all, officially, Wade said, just as there are no longer any cemeteries. But important people are still given private burials and their remains secretly preserved all a matter of influence. I've no influence. I'm not important. Wouldn't you think they'd consider it risky to keep me alive under the circumstances? If there'd ever be an investigation. Who would investigate? Not the government, surely. But suppose there's a political turnover. Suppose Congress wants to make capital of the situation. There is no Congress. Harry gasped. No Congress? As of last month, it was dissolved. Henceforth we are governed by the Cabinet, with authority delegated to department heads. But that's preposterous! Nobody'd stand still for something like that! They did stand still, most of them. After a year of careful preparation, of wholesale exposés of congressional graft and corruption and inefficiency, turned out that Congress was the villain all along. The senators and representatives had finagled tariff barriers and restrictive trade agreements which kept our food supply down. They were opposing international federation. In plain language, people were sold a bill of goods. Get rid of Congress and you'll have more food. That did it. But you'd think the politicians themselves would realize that they were cutting their own throats, the state legislatures and the governors. Legislatures were dissolved by the same agreement, Wade went on. There are no states any more, just governmental districts based upon sensible considerations of area and population. This isn't the old-time expanding economy based on obsolescence and conspicuous consumption. The primary problem at the moment is sheer survival. In a way, the move makes sense. Old-fashioned political machinery couldn't cope with the situation. There's no time for debate when instantaneous decisions are necessary to national welfare. You've heard how civil liberties were suspended during the old wars. Well, there's a war on right now. A war against hunger. A war against the forces of fecundity. In another dozen years or so, when the left-shot generation is full-grown and a lot of the elderly have died off, the tensions will ease. Meanwhile, quick action is necessary. Arbitrary action. But you're defending dictatorship! Richard Wade made a sound which is usually accompanied by a derisive shrug. Am I? Well, I didn't when I was outside, and that's why I'm here now. Harry Collins cleared his throat. What did you do? If you refer to my profession, I was a scripter. If you refer to my alleged criminal activity, I made the error of thinking the way you do, and the worse error of attempting to inject such attitudes in my scripts. 
Seems that when Congress was formally dissolved, there was some notion of preparing a timely show, a sort of historical review of the body using old film clips. What my superiors had in mind was a comedy of errors, a cavalcade of mistakes and misdeeds showing just why we were better off without supporting a political sideshow. Well, I carried out the assignment and edited the films, but when I drafted a rough commentary, I made the mistake of taking both a pro and con slant. Nothing like that ever reached the telescreens, of course, but what I did was promptly noted. They came for me at once and hustled me off here. I didn't get a hearing or a trial, either. But why didn't they execute you, or— Harry hesitated. Is that what you expect? Why didn't they execute you? Wade shot back. He was silent for a moment before continuing. No, I don't expect anything like that now. They'd have done it on the spot if they intended to do so at all. No, I've got another idea about people like you and myself, and about some of the congressmen and senators who dropped out of sight, too. I think we're being stockpiled. Stockpiled? It's all part of a plan. Give me a little time to think. We can talk again later. Wade chuckled once more. Looks as if there'll be ample opportunity in the future. And there was. In the months ahead, Harry spoke frequently with his friend behind the wall. He never saw him. Prisoners at Stark Falls were exercised separately, and there was no group assembly or recreation. Surprisingly adequate meals were served in surprisingly comfortable cells. In the matter of necessities, Harry had no complaints. And now that he had someone to talk to, the time seemed to go more swiftly. He learned a great deal about Richard Wade during the next few years. Mostly, Wade liked to reminisce about the old days. He talked about working for the networks, the commercial networks, privately owned, which flourished before the government took over communications media in the 80s. That's where you got your start, eh? Harry asked. Lord, no, boy, I'm a lot more ancient than you think. Why, I'm pushing sixty-five, born in 1940. That's right, during World War II. I can almost remember the atomic bomb. And I sure as hell remember the Sputniks. It was a crazy period, let me tell you. The pessimists worried about the Russians blowing us up, and the optimists were sure we had a glorious future in the conquest of space. Ever hear that old fable about the blind man examining an elephant? Well, that's the way most people were, each of them groping around and trying to determine the exact shape of things to come. A few of us even made a little money from it for a while, writing science fiction. That's how I got my start. You were a writer? Sold my first story when I was eighteen or so. Kept on writing off and on for almost twenty years. Of course, Robertson's thermonuke formula came along in seventy-five, and after that everything went to pot. It knocked out the chances of future war, but it also knocked out the interest in speculation or escape fiction. So I moved over into television for a while and stayed with it. But the old science fiction was fun while it lasted. Ever read any of it? No, Harry admitted. That was all before my time. Tell me, though, did any of it make sense? I mean, did some of those writers foresee what was really going to happen? <laughs> there were plenty of penny prophets and nickel Nostradamuses, Wade told him. But as I said, most of them were assuming war with the Communists or a new era of space travel. Since Communism collapsed and spaceflight was just an expensive journey to a dead end and dead worlds, it followed that the majority of fictional futures were founded on fallacies. And all the rest of the extrapolations dealt with superficial social manifestations. For example, they wrote about civilizations dominated by advertising and mass motivation techniques. It's true that during my childhood this seemed to be a logical trend, but once demand exceeded supply, the whole mechanism of stimulating demand, which was advertising's chief function, bogged down, and mass motivation techniques today are dedicated almost entirely to maintaining minimum resistance to a system ensuring our survival. Another popular idea was based on the notion of an expanding matriarchy, a gerontomatriarchy, rather, in which older women would take control. In an age when women outlived men by a number of years, this seemed possible. Now, of course, shortened working hours and medical advances have equalized the lifespan. And since private property has become less and less of a factor in dominating our collective destinies, it hardly matters whether the male or female has the upper hand. Then there was the common theory that technological advances would result in a push-button society, where automatons would do all the work. And so they might, if we had an unlimited supply of raw materials to produce robots and unlimited power sources to activate them. 
As we now realize, atomic power cannot be utilized on a minute scale. Last but not least, there was the concept of a medically oriented system, with particular emphasis on psychotherapy, neurosurgery, and parapsychology. The world was going to be run by telepaths, psychosis eliminated by brainwashing, intellect developed by hypnotic suggestion. It sounded great, but the conquest of physical disease has occupied the medical profession almost exclusively. No, what they all seemed to overlook with only a few exceptions was the population problem. You can't run a world through advertising when there are so many people that there aren't enough goods to go around anyway. You can't turn it over to big business when big government has virtually absorbed all of the commercial and industrial functions just to cope with an ever-growing demand. A matriarchy loses its meaning when the individual family unit changes character under the stress of an increasing population pressure which eliminates the old-fashioned home, family circle, and social pattern. And the more we must conserve dwindling natural resources for people, the less we can expend on experimentation with robots and machinery. As for the psychologist-dominated society, there are just too many patients and not enough physicians. I don't have to remind you that the military caste lost its chance of control when war disappeared, and that religion is losing ground every day. Class lines are vanishing, and racial distinctions will be going next. The old idea of a world federation is becoming more and more practical. Once the political barriers are down, miscegenation will finish the job. But nobody seemed to foresee this particular future. They all made the mistake of worrying about the hydrogen bomb instead of the sperm bomb. Harry nodded thoughtfully, although Wade couldn't see his response. But isn't it true that there's a little bit of each of these concepts in our actual situation today, he asked? I mean, government and business are virtually one and the same, and they do use propaganda techniques to control all media. As for scientific research, look at how we've rebuilt our cities and developed synthetics for food and fuel and clothing and shelter. When it comes to medicine, there's Leffingwell and his inoculations. Isn't that all along the lines of your early science fiction? Where's your underground? Richard Wade demanded. My what? Your underground, Wade repeated. Hell, every science fiction yarn about a future society has its underground. That was the whole gimmick in the plot. The hero was a conformist who tangled with the social order. Come to think of it, that's what you did years ago. Only instead of becoming an impotent victim of the system, he'd meet up with the underground movement. Not some sour ball like your friend Richie, who tried to operate on his own hook without real plans or system, but a complete sub-Rosa organization, bent on starting a revolution and taking over. There'd be wise old priests and wise old crooks and wise old officers and wise old officials all playing a double game and planning a coup. Spies all over the place, get me? And in no time at all, our hero would be playing tag with the top figures in the government. That's how it all worked out in all the stories. But what happens in real life? What happened to you, for example? You fell for a series of stupid tricks, stupidly perpetrated, because the people in power are people, and not the kind of synthetic super-intellects dreamt up by frustrated fiction fabricators. You found out that the logical candidates to constitute an underground were the naturalists. Again, they were just ordinary individuals with no genius for organization. As for coming in contact with key figures, you were actually on hand when Leffingwell completed his experiments, and you came back years later to hunt him down, very much in the heroic tradition, I admit. But you never saw the man except through the telescopic sights of your rifle. That was the end of it. No modern-day Machiavelli has hauled you in to play cat-and-mouse games with you, and no futuristic Freud has bothered to wash your brain or soft-soap your subconscious. You just aren't that important, Collins. But they put me in a special prison. Why? Who knows? They put me here, too. You said something once about stockpiling us. What did you mean? Well, it was just an old science fiction idea. I suppose I'll tell you about it tomorrow, eh? And so the matter and Harry Collins rested for the night. The next day, Richard Wade was gone. Harry called to him, and there was no answer. He cried out, and he cursed, and he paced his cell, and he walked alone in the courtyard, and he begged the impassive guards for information. And he sweated, and he talked to himself, and he counted the days, and he lost count of the days. Then, all at once, there was another prisoner in the adjacent cell, and his name was William Chang, and he was a biologist. 
He was reticent about the crime he had committed, but quite voluble about the crimes committed by others in the world outside. Much of what he said about genes and chromosomes and recessive characteristics in mutation seemed incomprehensible to Harry. But in their talks one thing emerged clearly enough. Chang was concerned for the future of the race. Leffingwell should have waited, he said. It's the second generation that will be important, as I tried to tell my people. Is that why you're here? Chang sighed. I suppose so. They wouldn't listen, of course. Overpopulation has always been the curse of Asia, and this seemed to be such an obvious solution, but who knows? The time may come when they need men like myself. So you were stockpiled, too. What's that? Harry told him about Richard Wade's remarks, and together they tried to puzzle out the theory behind them. But not for long, because once again Harry Collins awoke in the morning to find the adjoining cell empty, and once again he was alone for a long time. At last a new neighbor came. His name was Lars Nilstrom. Nilstrom talked to him of ships and shoes and sealing wax and the thousand and one things men will discuss in their loneliness and frustration, including, inevitably, their reason for being here. Nilstrom had been an instructor under vocational apt, and he was at a loss to explain his presence at Stark Falls. When Harry spoke of the stockpiling theory, his fellow prisoner demurred. It's more like Kafka than science fiction, he said, but then, I don't suppose you've ever read any Kafka. Yes, I have, Harry told him. Since I came here, I've done nothing but read old books. Lately, they've been giving me micro-scans. I've been studying up on biology and genetics. Uh, talking to Chang got me interested. In, in fact, I'm really going in for self-education. There's nothing else to do. Self-education? That's the only method left nowadays. Nilstrom sounded bitter. I don't know what's going to become of our heritage of knowledge in the future. I'm not speaking of technological skill. So-called scientific information is carefully preserved. But the humanities are virtually lost. The concept of the well-rounded individual is forgotten. And when I think of the crisis to come... What crisis? A new generation is growing up. Ten or fifteen years from now we'll have succeeded in erasing political and racial and religious divisions. But there'll be a new and more dangerous differentiation. A physical one. What do you think will happen when half the world is around six feet tall and the other half under three? I can't imagine. Well, I can. The trouble is, most people don't realize what the problem will be. Things have moved too swiftly. Why, there were more changes in the last hundred years than in the previous thousand, and the rate of acceleration increases. Up until now we've been concerned about too rapid technological development, but what we have to worry about is social development. Most people have been conditioned to conform. Yes, that's our job in vocational apt. But the system only works when there's a single standard of conformity. In a few years there'll be a double one, based on size. What then? Harry wanted some time to consider the matter, but the question was never answered, because Lars Nielstrom went away in the night, as had his predecessors before him. And in succeeding interludes Harry came to know a half a dozen other transient occupants of the cell next to his. They came from all over, and they had many things to discuss, but always there was the problem of why they were there, and the memory of Richard Wade's premise concerning stockpiling. There came a time when the memory of Richard Wade merged with the memory of Arnold Ritchie. The past was a dim montage of life at the agency and the treatment center and the ranch, a recollection of lying on the river bank with women in attitudes of apothotness or of lying against the boulders with a rifle. Somewhere there was an image of a child's wide eyes and a voice saying, My name is Harry Collins. But that seemed very far away. What was real was the cell and the years of talking and reading the microscans and trying to find a pattern. Harry found himself describing it all to a newcomer who said his name was Austin, a soft-voiced man who became a resident of the next cell one day in 2029, and eventually he came to Wade's theory. Maybe there were a few wiser heads who foresaw a coming crisis, he concluded. Maybe they anticipated a time when they might need a few nonconformists, people like ourselves who haven't been passive or persuaded. Maybe we're the government's insurance policy. If an emergency arises, we'll be freed. And then what would you do? Austin asked softly. You're against the system, aren't you? Yes, but I'm for survival. Harry Collins spoke slowly, thoughtfully. You see, I've learned something through the years of study and contact here. Rebellion is not the answer. You hated Leffingwell. 
Yes, I did, until I realized that all this was inevitable. Leffingwell is not a villain, and neither is any given individual in or out of our government. Our road to hell has been paved with only the very best of intentions. Killing the engineers and contractors will not get us off that road, and we're all on it together. We'll have to find a way of changing the direction of our journey. The young people will be too anxious to merely rush blindly ahead. Most of my generation will be sheep-like, moving as part of the herd because of their conditioning. Only we old-time rebels will be capable of plotting a course, a course for all of us. What about your son? Austin asked. I'm thinking of him, Harry Collins answered, of him and of all the others. Maybe he does not need me. Maybe none of them need me. Maybe it's all an illusion. But if the time ever comes, I'll be ready. And meanwhile, I can hope. The time has come, Austin said gently. And then he was standing miraculously enough outside his cell and before the door to Harry's cell. And the door was opening. And once again Harry stared into the wide eyes he remembered so well. The same wide eyes set in the face of a full-grown man. A full-grown man, three feet tall. He stood up shakily as the man held out his hand and said, Hello, father. But I don't understand. I've waited a long time for this moment. I had to talk to you, find out how you really felt, so that I'd be sure. Now you're ready to join us. What's happening? What do you want with me? We'll talk later, Harry's son smiled. Right now, I'm taking you home. End of chapter 8 of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch